Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on the Fair Compare weekly video podcast. My name is Rick Sini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of FairCompare.com. And we're going to talk about a, a story that came out uh, a couple days ago uh, around a, a fairly significant petition with about 30,000 signatures on it from FlyerRights.org that basically would love for the FAA, which is part of the Department of Transportation, to actually govern the minimum distance between seats, uh, sometimes called seat pitch in some cases, um, uh, and the overall size of seats, it appears. Uh, it's a pretty large petition. So joining me today to talk a little bit about this petition and uh, what may or may not happen is our editor from the side at Fair Compare, Ann McDermott. Hey, Ann. Hey, Rick. Well, what really got me going about this petition is that they were talking a sure. lot also about the width of the seats and they want all seats to be 18 inches is wide. And I sort of glanced down and I thought, oh, I don't know if that's big enough. <laughs> but then uh, Divide I Divide by two. <laughs> and then I see, uh, I, I, I looked up, well, I went to Seat Guru and looked up what a lot of the airline's widths are. And, oh, 17 inches is what a lot of them have. And it's not just the, you know, the, the cheap discount uh, ones. Um uh, United has a lot of 17 inches or, or seats that are less than 18 inches. I gather uh, 17 and a half inches is, makes a big deal of difference more than 17 inches or whatever. It just seems real small to me. Yeah, no, there's no doubt as as you're watching the video podcast, clearly I'm six foot one and uh, and uh, 18 inches would be just fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> 17 ain't so great. Um, but um, I would also note too that uh, one of the things that was in this that I thought was interesting was that basically the FAA doesn't govern the distance between seats or any of the things. In fact, the only rule appears to be that you have to be able to exit the plane during an emergency in 90 seconds or less. So I guess you know, if, even if you stack people up as a cord of wood, as long as they could exit the plane, you'd be in pretty good shape. Well, I wonder if they ever do drills on actual, you know, not during an actual flight, of course, but I mean, take a, take a plane, stuff it with a whole bunch of people, you know, look around at your next flight. Do you think everybody can get out in 90 seconds? 90 I, seconds. I, uh, I don't uh, know. <laughs> Well, I I think I've seen people when I'm on the aisle seat take at least three minutes to get from the window seat <laughs> just to the aisle way. I mean, to go to the bathroom, yeah. <laughs> I know. So I don't know what that's all about. But I don't know why uh, we're laughing. <laughs> well, that's because I have thoughts of assuming the crash position from uh, airplane <sighs> as you try to get off the plane in 90 seconds or less. Oh. Uh, uh, well, but, you know, the interesting thing about this is that um, the FAA's response, of course, is, hey, we've noted your your particular issue and we may take that up at some point. Now, the FAA has been fairly, along the Department of Transportation, has been uh, fairly activist uh, over the last five or six years during the Obama administration. We've seen things like uh, the three and four hour tarmac rule get implemented, mm -hmm. the, 20, the 24 hour guarantee. Now, a lot of this comes from the Passenger Bill of Rights. It has been running around the U.S. Uh, Congress for a long time, which hasn't gotten much traction. There was also uh, um, one one run up the flagpole in New York. Uh, Europe has a passenger bill of rights that covers many of these things. Um, and we don't have one here. So the Department of Transportation is taking piece of these like things like, you know, governing a seat size or distance between seats, for example, and uh, potentially making rules out of those. Well, it would be interesting to see if they do anything about it. You know, one thing, if you go on the FAA website, they talk about how it's really only safe for little ones. You know, I'm talking about children under the age of two that are allowed to sit on their parents' right. laps. Uh, the FAA doesn't like that. They want, they say, you know, the only really safe thing to do is put them in their own seat. But they don't, they don't mandate that. It's not a rule. I'm so, I'm, and I'm actually surprised about that because I do see a lot of under two infant and lap uh, babies, and it, it just after all the stuff we've written and some of the studies we've looked at, this clearly is something that sounds like they could easily amend that rule. But I, again, I think a part of that too is that airlines would lose passengers if, uh, you know, in some cases, some families had to actually pay for a full adult seat. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. Ever taken a mystery flight? 
Ah, gosh, you know, <laughs> I I did one time, to be honest, Ann. Did you? Was, yeah, I did. Back in, I think it was somewhere around 2000 or so, maybe in 1999, I actually went to Name Your Own Price on Priceline to give it a try. Yeah. And at the time, name your own price wouldn't tell you the airline. It wouldn't. It wouldn't tell you the time of day that you were flying. Um, and um, so, as I recall, um, and I don't remember exactly which airline it ended up being. I it, remember back then there was fifteen or sixteen airlines. <laughs> there was tons more. <laughs> and uh, it was at a very odd time of the day, and it and it had a trip a double or a single connect, a double connect. And I didn't really have a great experience and I didn't really do it, but it was cheap. Did you Did you know where you were going? <laughs> yes, I did know the day and where I was going. Where were you and going? You, uh, I think I was going to St. Louis that time. I think we were actually visiting some place in St. Louis. Huh. It was actually a business trip. So it was sort of a, um, you know, back in the days when uh, money was a little bit tighter around here. <laughs> and you couldn't afford a regular seat in the back. Um, but um, yeah, so um, I, I've tried it in the past. I've never tried one of these sort of mystery flights that we, we've we seen some people actually, um, you know, toss out there. I know that German Wings, which is a, a, a subsidiary of Lufthansa, Virgin Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about Priceline, even Hotwire, which, which they don't do. Uh, today, back at, at that time frame, back around uh, the turn of the century, it sounds so terrible, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. The uh, they used to they had a similar thing where you sort of knew the time of day as well, right? You didn't know the airline, but the flight left between noon and three, and it was the worst case a non, uh, you know, a, a one stop or something. Well, some of them sound intriguing. I noticed that you know German wings they allow you to pick your category, like you can pick. Uh, you know, you want something sunny or you want, a, a, you know, shopping and, you know, or or culture. Um, I, I think, you know, they could probably send you to any, uh, you know, loads of cities and you, uh, you know, it would still fit the category. But apparently it's uh, some of these are quite cheap, as you say. But yeah, no, they're very cheap. You know, I have a it's a funny story. I have a friend that uh, I think once a year he takes his family. They actually and I don't know why he does this because he's paying last minute rates. He takes his family up to Love Field, I guess, because the Southwest is a little bit cheaper and they decide where to go when they get to the airport. Wow. So they actually buy a ticket and get on a plane. They've been to San Diego before. I know they've done it that way. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's a family mystery flight. <laughs> well, now let's talk about uh, trips that, you know, they don't have the mystery. All they have is is allure and enticements and beautiful vistas and iconic attractions why we must be talking about these must-see destinations that we've put together that we think uh, people will really like, and uh, it, it, we're coming out with a an right. app very soon that's going to uh, include a lot of wonderful places, and I, I think people will have fun just going through that. But but we also put together a, a bunch of iconic destinations, and I'm wondering how many you have seen. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking through the list here. Uh, you know, starting off with the Great Barrier Reef, that is on my bucket list. I yeah. actually, have, I actually have not been. Uh, I, I've t I've been through Australia, but not uh, to uh, to stay there for any length of time other than you know half a day, or, or nor New Zealand, which is definitely on my bucket list. Uh, been I a know. lot. I've been a lot to to Southeast Asia, and uh, and I used to go to the eastern part of uh, Russia to Vladivostok stock periodically. Um, but I haven't been, you know, that far south. And it's certainly on my bucket list, uh, you know, Queenstown and a variety of other places. Certainly, um, that's on my bucket list. Now, as far as uh, the next one on the list, uh, you know, Turkey and Istanbul, been through there several different times, have nice. uh, have been through the mosque, or at least around the mosque. Um, so that's there. And, and, you know, the other one that sort of eluded me, because I've had at least two different trips that I've ended up having to cancel was to the pyramids in Egypt. It's mm. on my buck. It's on my bucket list, but I, it's just for me. It just doesn't seem worth the uh, the, the potential danger over the last uh, basically decade or so. 
Well, uh, things change. Uh, security situations change. This is yeah, why sure. it's always a good idea to check with travel.state.gov. <laughs> I if agree. You're yeah. a, a U.S. citizen, although it's probably helpful for people around the world, too, and although they have their own the equivalents of state departments, but things like that are good to check. But, you know, just for some more ideas, if, if this is the kind of thing, if you're looking for a place to go, you know, just an hour outside of Beijing, you can get to the, the Great Wall of China and Cambodia. It's not too far from, uh, well, you fly to Siem Reap, if I'm pronouncing <laughs> that right, to go well, to you- Angkor Wat, the temple. Yeah, no, you you know, I've I actually had dinner in China because my wife and I did a mileage run back four or five years ago where we actually uh, flew and my wife in one trip got uh, American Airlines platinum status by taking one trip. Oh, um, those days are gone. I, I don't think <laughs> mileage running pays anymore, does it? It's, it doesn't pay as well as it used to before, but um, went to went to Beijing, had dinner in Beijing, spent and, and went to every major attraction in less than one day. We had four different guides that picked us up and then we're off wow. jetting back home. So uh, that was quite a, quite a trip. So I have been there as well. And, um, you know, the list is long. It includes places in Cambodia. I just got back from Scotland, uh, Edinburgh Castle, been there many times. The French Festival in that area is absolutely perfect place to visit um, uh, during Are the summertime. Are you saying you should go to Scotland to attend a French festival? <laughs> fringe, F-R-I-N-G. Oh, fringe, fringe. <laughs> I will enunciate better. I've been uh, thinking, so okay. what are all these Parisians doing gathering in Scotland? But I'm whatever. positive there are some per- Parisians actually at the Fringe uh, Festival. I'm sure. <laughs> So, okay, come to the article, lots of good places. And, and as Ad mentioned, I'm super stoked about uh, getting our new native app out there. Uh, I, can we say the name? Is it Adventurous? Or uh, can we say that name on there? Oh, well, I guess we just did. As far so. as I'm concerned, you're the boss, pal. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. So, yeah. So look for that new native app in the, shortly, and we'll send out an email to folks uh, in both the, the Android and iOS or, or iPhone app store. So check that out here soon. And I, I know you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. We've enjoyed putting it together. So it uh, should be some fun. Now let's talk about a subject that is um, for, for U.S. people, um, Americans specifically, we mean the holiday called Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, in late my November. favorite holiday. And Actually, this, yeah, just got through buying holiday, my tickets, yeah. This is the holiday everybody's got to fly, or most of us do, or some of us do, tons of yeah. us do. Yeah. And we pay big bucks for Thanksgiving tickets. We do, yeah. As we've noted on previous podcasts, you know, holiday travel is about getting what I like to call a better bad deal. I think that's my official quote for that, for those kind of things. And uh, Thanksgiving is no different. In fact, I was, I think we bought our Thanksgiving tickets a couple weeks ago. Um, And um, so I'm already done with that. And actually, I think that's the important part is people should be shopping right now. I know the, the article notes that, uh, you know, every day you procrastinate in September, you can add about $3 to the cost of your airline ticket per person. And then once you hit October 1st, adding about $5 will. So if that doesn't spur you on to start shopping right now. So here's a few tips that always work for Thanksgiving, right? So the two busiest days of the year, bar none, are the Wednesday before and the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Right. Um, have been historically, and I expect them to be up one or two percent again because we have to do a little bit, a little more more cap- capacity, and those planes are going to be completely full. Not so you're quincy- saying the prices are going to be up about one percent over last year? No, I think the the capacity. So we'll see oh, more passengers okay. in there, but the prices I believe will be very similar <laughs> to, to what they were last year, which is fairly expensive for yeah. that time frame. Now you can get a, a little bit better bad deal. Stay away from Wednesday and Sunday, the most expensive days, uh, the cheapest day. So sort of starts Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, and then from a, ret- and actually the very cheapest day is leaving uh, Thanksgiving morning, uh, Thursday morning. If you've got a flight under two hours, perfect time to get out in the morning. Nobody's in the air. You're going to have empty middle seats or even the entire row to yourself. I've done that a few times. Plus you won't have to peel potatoes or do whatever else mom <laughs> Yeah, you'll you arrive just as dinner arrives and you'll catch football right after and, and, 
uh, but you will have to help on the cleanup. So that's the only part you missed there. Uh, and then heading back, you know, uh, Monday is your best bet Saturday to avoid that Sunday. What about as you're Tuesday? Going there. The December first, Tuesday, or is that? It's uh, not. It's actually better than. It's even better than than the Monday too. So it's a little bit cheaper as well. So, it, it, you know, if you if you looked at it, um, you know, basically the worst possible itinerary is Wednesday evening and su- and Sunday evening. Which, if if you have a student, say, yes, for example, a child in college, you know, that's when you, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's sure. when you're kind of limited. You you might have to bring them home. But I know, I know you have a college student, so we know that you know all about this. Well, there's a couple of things you can do for one thing. I mean, just whittle away costs here and there. And, you know, you, you've already pointed it out that if you can avoid the convenience of a nonstop, that, that will, you know, could save you a lot of money. It usually does. It almost but, always does. There's cases where the, the connecting flights are the same as a nonstop, but it's usually for flights that are shorter than 90 minutes. Okay. And what about, you know, fees? You, you know, goodness knows you can avoid at Thanksgiving is such a short holiday. You don't need to bring a big bag. That's going to cost you 50 bucks round trip. You can take a carry on. Yeah. In general, I think that's probably the case. Usually that's not a week long trip. Uh, you know, although, you know, we, we only have one airline now that doesn't charge a first check bag fee in Southwest. So, yeah. uh, we lost, we uh, rest in peace, jet blue on the bag fee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, well, they, they held out as long as they could, I guess. And I'm hoping Southwest holds out for at least another 18 months or so. That'll be interesting to see. Yeah. So anyway. basically for Thanksgiving, you need to be shopping now. Go ahead, pull the trigger on those tickets. Avoid Wednesday and Sunday after, uh, you know, and uh, fly Thursday morning if you have that chance to do so. Or start off earlier in the week, Monday, Tuesday, return on either Monday, Tuesday or Saturday. And you'll save yourself a little bit of money, uh, a better bad deal, as it were. And I just want to say if anybody's looking for more information on the, uh, these topics or gosh, just about a billion other topics, come to faircompare.com. We've got a bunch of blogs and we've got a bunch of advice, most of them written by Rick Sini, and he knows what he's talking about. I'm an, I'm an airfare computer. Some of the other stuff I'm probably not as good at. That's why you're there to keep me in, uh, in check there. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no. And really the other thing too, I would note is we're coming out with a new native app for phones shortly. I think people will like that a lot. So give that a whirl here shortly in the next couple of weeks. If you'd like to hear more from Rick and me, uh, please subscribe to our podcast. We have a whole bunch of them. You can go on iTunes and let me see, Stitcher and SoundCloud. And I think you'll find something you enjoy. Great, thanks, Anne.